Uh, we have the pleasure today to have a, a review on uh, imaging survey and machine learning by Elizabeth Cross from the uh, University of Arizona. Uh, and I'm sure that will be a, a fantastic talk. So Elizabeth, the floor is yours. You have one hour and we'll discuss uh, after that. Okay. Thank you, Karim, and thank you very much to the organizers for putting together this uh, fantastic conference. I've really enjoyed uh, uh, learning what's going on in the rest of the field uh, yesterday already, and I look forward to many more discussions over coffee. I'll start off today, start off, off today with a um, review of imaging surveys and machine learning, where I have to admit uh, up front, it's impossible to keep up with the entire imaging survey and machine learning uh, literature. So this will be um, a biased perspective uh, from deep down in the analysis trenches of the Dark Energy Survey. Um, I'll start out with a, a quick outline of um, the uh, landscape of imaging surveys and how we go from um, those surveys to parameter constraints and then go through uh, a few uh, examples from the Dark Energy Survey mostly, starting with a pixel domain classification for different science cases then um, a few short time domain classification examples. And uh, at, at, towards the end, uh, I'll focus on systematics calibration for um, uh, weak lensing and clustering uh, cosmology analyses. So uh, let me start off by putting imaging surveys into um, a recent context here, uh, where I'm showing some recent surveys uh, in terms of uh, survey completion year, um, ordered uh, that way, and then the blue squares indicate the survey area on sky, and uh, the red dots um, show you the um, survey depths in terms of the observed galaxy density uh, that can make it into weak lensing analyses. And there we have this uh, uh, generation of surveys ending in around 2009, CFHLS, Cosmos, and the imaging part of SDSS, uh, with very different survey strategies. And while these surveys uh, are done, the analysis are by far not. Um, you've heard uh, results uh, yesterday still uh, from Cosmos, and there will be many more to come. So these data sets uh, will keep us busy for a while. And uh, by now, we are starting to make sense of data that arrived on our hard drives in the last few years. The kilodegree survey, the dark energy survey, and hyper subprime cam, um, which are now really um, starting to do um, precision cosmology with big lensing all following slightly different survey strategies in terms of um, area versus depth. And uh, it's really good to have these three collaborations at the same time. Uh, we check each other uh, and keep us uh, on our toes. So thanks uh, not only to uh, all my collaborators in DES, uh, but um, also to the friendly col um, collaborators or sometimes friendly um, competition in KIDS and HSC. And this is really the training ground uh, to then um, um, take these analyses to the level of billions of galaxies starting to arrive soon uh, from Euclid, um, the Roman Space Telescope, and Vera Rubin Observatory, which really uh, will challenge these analyses um, to go to a new level of systematics control. Not only because of the number of galaxies, uh, but also because of the imaging quality, showing you here the same piece of sky uh, going from SDSS uh, to decals, similar to the Dark Energy Survey, uh, to HSC, which is uh, basically also the uh, precursor to Vera Rubin Observatory, uh, and space-based candles, showing you that it's not only the number of galaxies, but really the imaging quality uh, that will um, throw new challenges at us as we go forward. In um, uh, all these uh, analyses, roughly the process uh, going from images to astrophysics constraints uh, is that we start off um, uh, with a source catalog on photometry, which of course is a huge uh, research area uh, by itself, and doing photometry right, something that I can't do justice in one talk. Uh, but then the next step uh, um, is object classification and detection. Uh, then, uh, if we want to do, uh, especially if we want to do population studies, uh, we will need our sample selection. That is, we really have to characterize uh, the selection probability uh, in terms of the distribution and biases, uh, in terms of hidden variables also. Then uh, we can proceed, uh, to, or at the same time, we can proceed to measurements of our um, sample properties or summary, summary statistics. And then in the last step, there is modeling and inference. 
I have now written this as a linear process, but of course in reality it's not, uh, which uh, complicates analysis greatly. And uh, especially uh, the step of object classification and characterizing our sample selection uh, may be tied together. Uh, and that is uh, really um, a major systematic challenge for many of these analyses. So in this talk, I'll highlight uh, some examples on the um, importance of the selection function and uh, systematics uh, uncertainty um, quantification. And I refer to Ben's uh, talk yesterday and Paco's review um, coming up uh, on the modeling and inference part largely. And uh, as we're talking about selection biases, again, uh, the examples in this talk are largely from the Dark Energy Survey, but uh, I um, um, refer to other t talks from different survey collaborations um, uh, in the bottom uh, as much as possible. Okay, the Dark Energy Survey um, is uh, based on the Blanco 4 meter telescope uh, at CTIO in Chile. Um, it is a survey with a um, three degree uh, field of view um, camera uh, and uh, um, massive CCD chip uh, shown there in the upright, uh, which uh, consists of 570 megapixels and uh, using GRIZ Y filters. That is massive, but still uh, small compared to uh, uh, the field of view and um, camera of uh, Ruben um, Observatory coming online soon. So this is a good initial training ground. From, from that uh, um, telescope and that camera, uh, we um, basically have two surveys, uh, one wide field imaging survey over 5,000 square degrees, observed from 2013 to 2019, and then um, smaller supernovae fields with about a weekly cadence. And uh, we have overlap with um, um, CMB surveys and Stripe 82 uh, to maximize cross-correlation science, uh, which uh, then uh, results in this um, uh, funny footprint on sky. Uh, the um, data, um, data release two of the um, full six years uh, has uh, over 500 million galaxies and 145 million st stars down to a limiting magnitude R of 23. So that's already quite a massive uh, data set. And uh, this data uh, is initially analyzed by a collaboration of about 400 scientists uh, from 25 uh, institutions uh, in seven countries. And lots of the science uh, and leadership in this uh, collaboration is really driven by um, early career scientists, that's students and postdocs. And uh, we also um, have a lot of um, outreach or, or making a science understandable activities, uh, including dark hives uh, that uh, explain um, even technical analysis in terms of cartoons. Uh, so. Uh, if you want to learn about some part of the dark energy survey that's far from your own science, I encourage you to check these out as well. Uh, while we are called the dark energy survey, uh, we really span a wide range of uh, science with this fantastic data set. Um, on here um, are listed uh, our science working groups, transient and moving objects, galaxy evolution and um, QSOs, strong lensing, large scale structure, Milky Way, supernovae, galaxy clusters, and reglensing. Um, in these groups and across working groups, we produce a lot of astrophysics and cosmology. And uh, in particular, I'd like to highlight a, a paper from 2016, the Dark Energy Survey, More Than, More Than Dark Energy, which gives a really nice overview uh, of all these different science motivations um, for analyzing uh, this uh, fantastic data set. And with that, I'll now give you um, a very Im incomplete list of science highlights. There have been over 380 papers from the ES so far, um, lots of different science cases, and lots of methodology advances um, needed to produce these results. Let's start out um, with uh, classification uh, locally and moving out, um, starting off with Milky Way science, where there's a massive discovery space characterizing dwarf galaxies stellar streams, globular clusters, a proper motion, brown dwarfs and ultra cool objects, uh, and a stellar distribution in the Milky Way. Milky Way. Uh, the two figures here uh, show you uh, uh, Milky Way satellite galaxies um, identified in um, DES and also uh, stellar streams. 
um, where for the um, Milky Way satellite um, identification, uh, we use um, a matched filter and also likelihood-based um, search. Uh, and the selection function is then uh, carefully uh, characterized uh, through artificial injection throughout the footprint to really um, understand the selection function as a, fun as a function of position uh, and object properties. With that, uh, one can then use uh, this census of Milky Way satellites um, um, to constrain the um, um, subhalo mass function. Uh, and with that, also uh, put constraints uh, on dark matter properties. After, of course, carefully uh, marginalizing over um, satellite detectability and uncertainties in the galaxy halo connection. Where um, these plots here uh, from a fantastic paper led by grad student Ethan Nadler uh, show um, constraints, uh, for example, on the dark matter uh, proton scattering um, um, cross section and uh, the um, contribution from um, the S and Penn Stars 1 galaxies um, as the uh, enhancement um, of the constraints down here uh, in red. The next uh, Milky Way object uh, are stellar streams, uh, where we use an um, isochrone fitting and match filter technique uh, to search for uh, these um, streams that com are composed of stars uh, um, formed at the same time and located at approximately the same distance from us uh, that um, were then spread out uh, as uh, satellite galaxies uh, fall into uh, the Milky Way. And uh, there's another talk uh, on this conference about um, a deep learning stream detection in HSC. Uh, so you'll hear about um, a complementary me method there. Moving a bit further out, uh, there's low surface brightness galaxies. Uh, which uh, probe the um, halo galaxy connection uh, at the extreme low mass end. And uh, they're individual systems with both extremely high and extremely low um, uh, dark matter content, uh, which uh, um, put an interesting test um, to uh, dark matter models and galaxy formation. However, to really um, rigorously study this, uh, one needs a, a wide field census and completeness characterization, not just one or two objects. Um, two recent DES um, uh, papers um, provide a catalog of nearly 24,000 low surface brightness galaxies um, where the detection uh, uh, traditionally is uh, plagued uh, by galactic cirrus and other imaging artifacts, making it really difficult uh, to pick out these objects. Uh, and uh, that means that uh, CNNs um, um, trained on visually um, confirmed um, low surface brightness galaxies and imaging artifacts uh, are particularly well suited uh, uh, to um, pick out these objects compared to other classifiers. And uh, the initial paper um, demonstrates good transfer learning um, to deeper HSC data with only small retraining. However, the full completeness will still need to be characterized. Of course, also appropriate to then the final science case of how we turn the sample into constraints um, on dark matter or whatever the final um, case is. And on the top um, plot here, um, I'm um, reproducing um, the distribution of um, some low uh, surface brightness galaxies um, found in DES um, compared to uh, a previous uh, study uh, around the uh, Fornix cluster shown in blue. So these galaxies have similar properties and the DES um, sample uh, includes some um, um, ultra diffuse galaxies that are of particular interest. Then uh, moving on to regular galaxies. Uh, there will be several talks about this actually uh, here, uh, describing um, galaxy morphology uh, classification uh, for 27 million DS galaxies uh, using CNNs and also um, other classifiers, which will then uh, of course form a fantastic basis um, for more detailed studies of um, galaxy evolution uh, as a function of environment and such. Moving on to galaxy clusters, uh, the largest virilized objects in the universe, uh, which uh, are a sensitive probe of structure growth. However, uh, first we need uh, to find galaxies and uh, then um, figure out a mass observer relation between the observed proxy, mass proxy and the um, underlying halo mass. On the top right is an image uh, of a galaxy cluster in DES, which we uh, detect using the red mapper algorithm. Uh, that is um, over density of red sequence galaxies. 
and uh, then assign a probability that these galaxies are a member of the cluster. Uh, and these red, um, over density of red galaxies, um, the richness um, or the number of member galaxies, then is our mass proxy, uh, which we have to relate to halo mass using some mass calibration. The um, main DSE1 cluster analysis um, uses uh, weak lensing on small and large scales um, to calibrate um, halo masses. And um, this analysis resulted in the um, gray contours uh, shown over here. Well, that is interesting. And importantly, the red contour shown there uh, is the DES uh, weak lensing and galaxy clustering analysis um, on the same footprint uh, overlapping uh, in redshift. So uh, these uh, two contours are definitely highly co uh, correlated. They probe the same cosmic structure. Uh, and uh, something interesting is going on there. Of course, we realized that when we underlined the anal uh, analysis, um, the paper makes it clear that we don't uh, claim that uh, omega meta is 0.15 or so from the SG1 clusters. But uh, we had um, committed to publishing uh, the uh, underlining result. After that, we can go on uh, and make sense of it. And uh, for that, this figure here now com um, compares uh, the DES uh, baseline cluster uh, results uh, with different cluster selections and mass calibrations. Uh, the blue contours here um, show the uh, same sample, but mass calibration now from large-scale clustering. So uh, from the large-scale bias of these clusters, marginalized over a wide range of selection biases. And the um, black um, uh, open contours um, use uh, the mass um, observable relation calibrated from SPT, uh, TSZ, and weak lensing, but only for uh, the most uh, massive uh, Y1 clusters. So then comparing uh, uh, the uh, baseline green result uh, with uh, the black contours, um, that is uh, full mass selection to high masses, uh, we realize that this is, this is likely an issue with low mass clusters. And then comparing green and blue, um, that is different mass calibrations, uh, we then learn that this is a problem with small scale lensing. And uh, here uh, we are missing uh, some selection bias and projection effect that uh, we were not aware of before and that is missing in our um, simulations. Uh, however, knowing how Red Mapper works, we were then able to uh, think it through and realize what's going on. Uh, and that's uh, one of the selection uh, function caveats that I would like to point out um, for thinking how to move this forward with different uh, um, uh, cluster uh, selection um, algorithms, for example. Then uh, the next um, cosmology probe from the ES, strong lensing, where I'm showing here one particular example from a lens system that was uh, discovered um, through a vi visual search in DES data uh, and then turned into um, cosmology constraints through um, time delay cosmography uh, using um, um, a large um, um, compilation of external data obtained uh, after um, uh, they found this um, particularly interesting system of two um, sets of multiple images at different redshifts. So, uh, the, um, these constraints um, include uh, high, resolution, high resolution imaging from HST, redshifts um, for the uh, lens components, uh, velocity dispersions for the main lens, and time delays, uh, which then um, lead to um, quite competitive H0 um, constraints from a single system. Um, there is, of course, also a, a broader um, strong lens classification in DES uh, with several candidates. Um, and uh, uh, further analyses uh, where the, the main um, uh, sample um, started out uh, with a CNN trained on 250,000 simulated uh, lenses that then identified uh, about 7,000 um, candidates and after visual inspection about 84 probably or definitely lenses remain. This is a great sample for doing f further um, um, time delay studies uh, using it um, for the um, 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 subhalo mass function, of course, will again require a characterization of the um, selection function. And uh, there are several future-looking talks uh, at this conference um, uh, going into um, strong lensing searches in much more detail. 
on the time domain side. Um, this all starts with the supernovae fields, which are imaged with about a one-week cadence. Uh, and then um, candidates for spectroscopic follow-up um, are identified from first div for a difference imaging pipeline, followed up uh, with uh, uh, a random forest um, cl classifier that was trained on early DES data. And uh, the first uh, um, cosmology constraints uh, from um, supernovae that were all um, spectroscopically classified uh, are shown um, in the um, plot here. Uh, the final um, DSC5 um, supernovae cosmology results will then use uh, about 1,800 uh, photometrically typed uh, supernovae 1A um, uh, with um, spectroscopic redshifts for the hosts. Uh, that was uh, still manageable uh, at the uh, number of um, supernovae in DES. Uh, for Rubin Observatory, uh, this will get much more challenging. Instead of having um, small fields every week, uh, we'll have um, half the sky every three days. So uh, that is uh, quite a challenge for um, classifiers and uh, follow-up uh, criteria. And I'll just uh, point here to the uh, fantastic uh, plastics challenge um, for um, uh, classifiers um, uh, written up uh, in papers uh, by the collaboration and also a talk uh, by Catherine Al Katharina Alves on um, considerations for photometric um, uh, classification of supernovae with Rubin. The other uh, time domain uh, science case uh, in DES is uh, solar system si uh, um, science, uh, where we look for moving objects by comparing multiple exposures, uh, and then um, link their orbits. Uh, this uh, led uh, to a catalog of um, 815 um, trans-Neptunian objects, uh, one of the largest to date, uh, showing you here um, the um, uh, detected uh, TNOs as a function of uh, barycentric distance uh, and uh, magnitude. And uh, beyond trans-Neptunian objects, uh, of course, uh, you can also um, um, detect comets uh, uh, in the data set including um, a particular comet that's the largest well-studied comet to date. And that uh, uh, is being used uh, to inform er early migration scenarios of um, how a large objects in the Oort cloud uh, relate to the solar system. Now, uh, changing gears, let me uh, talk about systematics calibration for three cross two point cosmology. Uh, where we want to um, observe structure growth through, through clustering and uh, lensing. So we have some uh, uh, background source galaxies, uh, which on the way to us get lensed, the shapes get distorted. And uh, we also have a sample of foreground uh, lens galaxies that are clustered and that contribute um, to the lensing signal. So uh, we will then use uh, both the uh, positions of the foreground lenses and the shapes of the ba background galaxies um, to map out uh, the matter distribution um, along the line of sight. Specifically, uh, we consider the three different uh, two-point functions, cosmic shear as the shape-shape correlation, uh, galaxy clustering, the position-position correlation, and galaxy-galaxy uh, lensing, um, the correlation between the position of foreground uh, galaxies and background shapes. Uh, we can then um, use uh, two independent splits of this data. Cosmic shear alone, shown here in black, in terms of um, projected, uh, forecasted constraints, and clustering and galaxy galaxy lensing, shown in blue, uh, which have different underlying degeneracies. So we can first uh, use these uh, two uh, splits, data splits, as a consistency check. And um, if we find that uh, our modeling um, results in consistent constraints. We can combine them uh, in the uh, red contours, the joint three cross two point analysis, which maximizes the cosmological information um, by self calibrating um, the systematic parameters. This um, is um, not a neural net. Uh, this is um, an outline of the uh, DES GS3 um, analysis uh, showing you uh, all the interdependencies. Uh, this was uh, a flowchart uh, made by our analysis co coordinator, Michael Troxell, based on discussions uh, in the fall of 2017. So this analysis been, had been in, has been in the works for quite a while. 
Um, four years later, um, it has turned into cosmology results, uh, where this nice il illustration by uh, Alex Amon shows you um, in terms of uh, papers, how we go f start out uh, with uh, wide field images and deep field um, photometry plus characterization of the surface selection, going to redshift calibration, uh, then steps for galaxy shapes over here, starting with point spread function modeling and image simulations, going to shape catalogs and uh, blending and calibrations, and then going through uh, the actual two point measurement, simulations in theory to arrive at the uh, cosmology result. Uh, in practice then, uh, this analysis um, is spread out over 30 papers, establishing the catalogs and methodology. And of course, all these steps are interlinked, uh, which means that we really have to uh, be very careful uh, in terms of our systematics um, definition and calibration, and that everything uh, along this uh, long chain of papers is consistent. I will obviously not summarize 30 papers here. I will highlight um, a few examples uh, of um, systematics calibration, starting out uh, with uh, the elephant in the room, photometric redshift characterization. Of course, uh, imaging surveys need an accurate characterization of the redshift distribution, both for the lens and source galaxies, uh, in order to uh, yield uh, unbiased cosmology constraints. Uh, that has been a problem um, and challenge uh, in these analyses for a long time. Here we are using self-organizing maps, which is an unsupervised learning technique that is uh, becoming increasingly popular for photometric redshift characterization. And uh, the self-organizing map here um, organizes uh, 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 or provides a low dimensional representation of the galaxies uh, in the um, wide field DES color color space. And then each of these cells um, 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 is uh, then uh, looked at in um, uh, more detailed um, color, color space um, of uh, deep field observations uh, using additional vista bands. And uh, then again, uh, in that um, some uh, representation, uh, we, we find um, these uh, photometric uh, phenotypes that are then um, selected for a redshift, um, actual redshift follow up. This is one part of our DSCS3 redshift characterization where we use three independent sources of information. Uh, photometry, um, galaxy colors, uh, and uh, self-organizing maps. Then we also use galaxy clustering, uh, that is um, their positions uh, for um, class class cross clustering um, um, calibration of redshifts. And we use lensing uh, or shapes uh, to um, calculate shear ratios. Uh, that is a, a geometric test uh, that is particularly um, uh, sensitive to the um, galaxy re redshift distribution. So uh, in DES, um, we use the um, self-organizing map specifically to um, link um, spectroscopic many band redshifts with the DES deep fields shown um, on the um, footprint in, um, on the right uh, in orange. Uh, and then further uh, link these uh, to the um, uh, white field um, galaxy colors uh, and characterize that transfer function um, through uh, galaxy injections um, with a um, very detailed uh, uh, image injection uh, algorithm called Balrog. Uh, in equations in the end, uh, we want to at the end uh, calculate uh, the uh, redshift distribution uh, given our um, broadband um, um, bin, uh, our tomographic bin selection uh, and um, broadband color uh, and uh, weak lensing sample selection. And for that, uh, we then uh, uh, sum over the um, deep field uh, sums, um, C and the uh, wide field sums, C hat. So uh, based on the fewer bands uh, and uh, noisier data. Uh, and then uh, relate uh, our wide field um, distribution to uh, first uh, the um, uh, um, transfer function ca um, characterized by image uh, uh, in, uh, by the uh, Im image injection to the uh, deep field distribution, uh, and then uh, the redshift probability uh, or redshift distribution 
using the actual spectroscopic uh, follow-up of the deep field cells. Uh, that then gives us uh, our um, estimate. However, what we really need is the full distribution, including uncertainty uh, classification. So uh, uh, the uh, relevant papers then go to a detailed um, characterization of how much redshift sample um, limitations, uh, short noise and sample variance, photometric calibration, and differences of that uh, between different um, parts uh, of the SOM, the transfer function, and assumptions in the um, method um, contribute uh, to the uh, variance of the mean redshift in the different tomographic uh, bins. And uh, I really want to stress that uh, we don't just need one redshift distribution or one um, mean n of z. We, we need uh, the full uncertainty and uh, understand uh, what the sources of error in it are. Here, um, I then summarize the current impact of photometric redshift modeling on cosmology, both from the ES year three um, on the left for cosmic shear alone and from KIT's uh, Viking um, in the paper by Angus Wright, uh, where the different contours show you uh, slight variations of uh, the uh, photometric redshift method. I think the important point right now is that uh, we don't need to argue about uh, 0.3 sigma shifts. So, uh, this looks pretty good right now. However, uh, it will become much more challenging uh, going forward. And there's, of course, also ways to screw this up right now already, uh, but we don't need to talk about those. The next uh, um, systematic uh, calibration that I want to talk about is galaxy um, um, shapes uh, and uh, uncertainties uh, in that modeling, where, as you've seen uh, in this conference many times before, uh, Measuring weak lensing uh, is a complicated inverse process um, where we want to infer um, the shear uh, imparted on uh, our um, galaxy of intrinsically unknown um, ellipticity, which then uh, gets blurred by the atmosphere and telescope, um, pixelated in the detector, and we add noise. To help us uh, in that uh, inverse process, uh, we can observe stars, uh, our point sources, uh, that pass through the same atmosphere and telescope, uh, also get um, pixelated in the detector and are noised. And uh, in the DS analysis, uh, we use um, an algorithm um, called PIF, uh, PSFs in the full field of uh, view, uh, based on uh, Gaussian process interpolation to get a model of the point spread function um, um, ac um, across um, um, the position um, um, in the field of view. We then use uh, this uh, estimate of the position-dependent um, uh, PSF to first deconvolve um, the PSF uh, from our images, and then use an uh, algorithm um, called meta-calibration, uh, where we uh, then apply an additional artificial uh, shear um, on the deconvolved image, reconvolve with the PSF, uh, and um, measure uh, the uh, new ellipticity. From that response, uh, we can then uh, infer the shear which is an unbiased estimate uh, in the limit of weak shear, isolated galaxies, and perfect knowledge of the uh, PSF. Of course, uh, these uh, idealized uh, limits don't hold, and we then use simulations to calibrate biases, uh, especially from um, blending of galaxy images. So for that, uh, we turn to um, image simulations uh, based on the Galsum algorithm, uh, and these simulations are matched to the DS data in terms of um, selection functions, so redshift distribution, signal to noise, noise properties, uh, and everything. Um, uh, detailed um, uh, over many, many pages uh, in um, this paper by Neil led by Neil McCran. Uh, we then detect that measured shapes respond to the shear of galaxies at other redshifts, and uh, importantly, uh, model and account for the impact of blending as a re redshift mixing effect. So uh, we have both um, clean detections of isolated galaxies, uh, and then we study uh, uh, blended sources where we overlay galaxies at two distinct redshifts uh, and measure the resulting um, um, bias in the shear response. And uh, we then uh, use these um, 
measurements on image simulations uh, to um, uh, develop an effective redshift distribution, um, starting uh, that uh, modifies our original redshift distribution to account for blending um, uh, with the true shears. And uh, uh, for DES, we found that blending um, corresponds to about 1.5 to 4% uh, um, correction on uh, the multiplicative bias depending on the redshift bin. This is just one uh, approach uh, to blending. Um, you've heard about uh, several already, and I'm sure we will hear about more algorithms um, in the remaining days. The uh, fi final systematic that I want to touch on is um, uh, systematics for galaxy clustering, where we, um, of course, know that uh, the true galaxy density should be uncorrelated um, with uh, foreground effects, such as um, reddening or also survey properties. So that means uh, we then have to go and remove the correlation between observed galaxy density, survey properties, and astrophysical maps by reweighing um, our galaxy catalogs um, using a relation that is calibrated from data. And uh, the importance of this effect is nicely shown uh, in the uh, plot here on the right, where um, the red crosses first show you the clustering signal measured from the raw um, galaxy catalogs without weights, and then uh, in, in the gray symbols after correction for survey systematics. So this is a massive correction that is needed to um, uh, analyze galaxy clustering on large scales and also for galaxy-galaxy um, lensing. So specifically, uh, we account for correlations with air mass, seeing, exposure time, depth, stellar density, dust, sky brightness, and calibration residuals. Uh, where the plot here on the right shows you a linear combination of these uh, different survey maps that I just listed and how um, they or originally then uh, the galaxy um, density as a function of uh, these survey properties um, correlates uh, with uh, the survey maps. And then through an iterative process uh, we adjust weights such that uh, uh, the um, galaxy density becomes uncorrelated uh, with uh, these um, foregrounds. And for that, uh, we um, um, mainly use two different um, template-based methods. Uh, one, an iterative uh, systematics decont decontamination, shown here on the right, and then also uh, an elastic net uh, to figure out the uh, linear regression uh, between the different maps and galaxy density, uh, finding the right penalty between bias and variance. So far, these are two linear methods. Uh, I briefly want to highlight um, a nice study uh, led by Mehdi Rizai in EBOS, um, character, um, um, characterizing the importance of nonlinear systematics mitigation, where, uh, where he validated um, a fully connected neural network um, for nonlinear weights uh, of uh, imaging systematics that affect um, the ELG or quasar um, uh, selection in uh, EBOS. And to do so, uh, he randomly split the, split the footprint uh, into 60-20-20% um, uh, for training, validation, and testing. And uh, then again, um, use uh, the mean galaxy density as a function of um, galaxy, galaxy, galactic ext extinction in this case um, as a check uh, uh, to see uh, how well these methods perform. Again, in the end, we would um, expect the true um, galaxy density to be uncorrelated with these uh, foreground properties. And uh, there you can see a comparison of the um, standard method and uh, linear t um, template fitting uh, shown in uh, this uh, family of lines uh, and a nonlinear correction uh, with uh, different shot noise um, weightings um, shown by the um, purple uh, pink contours. And the gray band shows you the expected variance from MOX. So uh, in this case, uh, the nonlinear correction is important, uh, especially um, when looking at the um, power spectrum, corrected power spectrum monopole at low K, so for example, for studies of primordial non-Gaussianity. On the scales for DES, uh, we found that these um, nonlinear corrections are um, not so important. Uh, in the end, uh, we find uh, some uh, residuals from overcorrection uh, between the different methods and also template choices. Um, 
which are the very small on log normal NOx, uh, no, um, MOX, and we use these residuals um, in uh, further um, analytic marginalization. That is, we put them in the correlation function um, covariance um, to, um, uh, to marginalize them out uh, in the last step. And uh, again, turning to our image simulations, we find uh, that uh, the residual uh, contamination is far less than 10% of the signal and consistent with zero. With that, then, we have our um, decontaminated um, clustering measurement. There's a final cross-check here. Um, I'm showing a correlation function, both from the uncontaminated mock in black and um, applying the decontamination to the uncontaminated mock showing that we don't uh, incur a large bias in that case. Okay, with that now, we have calibrated our systematics uh, for the galaxy density, for the galaxy shapes, and the photometric redshift distribution. Let's turn them into uh, cosmology constraints. Uh, that is, uh, we um, want to um, infer our parameter posterior as usual, and as uh, you'll hear a lot here in this conference. Uh, the remaining uh, ingredients, of course, um, are a data likelihood, where we um, do all the approximations that uh, Ben warned about, uh, but we find that at our constraining power, uh, that is um, still sufficient. We also have to choose a particular model, including astrophysics, um, with um, a specific prioritization and um, corresponding priors. We have to choose criteria, um, which measurements to combine, and what we call attention. And then uh, the final ingredient is a blinding scheme to minimize observer bias. Uh, so the um, last check, uh, we um, then apply this anal analysis end-to-end to n-body -end, uh, -end marks, um, where we uh, go through the whole um, photometric redshift estimation process and all the uh, apply foregrounds, um, 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 reweigh the galaxies to remove the foregrounds and go to, through all the steps that I just described. Um, and uh, then we can analyze these mocks of a vol volume much larger than the DES survey volume using uh, the model that we uh, just arrived on and um, find uh, that uh, applying uh, our uh, final model to the uh, mean data vector of the mocks um, gives a consistent result with applying the model to itself. So um, at least uh, for those effects that are captured in the simulation, we find that our model performs um, sufficiently well for this analysis. However, I'd like to point out that at this point, we are 29 papers deep in the analysis, so we've made a lot of choices. Starting out on the catalog level, uh, there have been a lot of choices. Then uh, we uh, measure correlation functions, where I just uh, talked about, uh, for example, the uh, weights for those. Um, that's, again, a lot of choices. And then uh, our MCMCs also don't work um, the first time, so there's a lot of inference diagnostics uh, before we have the full inference. Uh, and we want to make sure that the choices we make in each of these steps um, are not driven by our um, prior what the final constraints should be. So uh, we minimize our observer bias um, in a three-stage blending process. At the catalog level, uh, we rescale galaxy ellipticities by an unknown factor. At the correlation function level, we transform the summary statistics corresponding to an unknown change uh, in WCDM parameters. And we also shifted um, all parameter plots um, by an unknown uh, offset uh, until we unblind it. Uh, we unblinded the parameter constraints after the data vectors and modeling were completely frozen. And before unblinding, we had also finalized the lists of model tests and combinations of external data that we wanted to pursue so that we don't go on a fishing expedition to maximize tension by picking um, which data to combine with. Then for the results, here's our split of the um, data again. Um, cosmic shear and uh, galaxy clustering and tangential shear in blue and orange. This is now on real data. Uh, the two splits of Well, What's that name? we found consistent cosmology from cosmic <laughs> shear and galaxy-galaxy <laughs> lensing. Um, with that, we can combine. We also got some constraints on S8. Yeah. Okay. 
Yep, so um, based on the good agreement of these two contours, both uh, in this uh, 2D Myers projection and in the full more than uh, 30 dimensional model space, we can combine uh, and get this um, black uh, um, contour, that's our fiducial DES three cross two point result. Uh, we also got some numbers, uh, which you can uh, read afterwards if you want. That's not my main point here. Rather, let me conclude um, what I uh, told you today about imaging surveys and relation to machine learning. So I hope you've seen that uh, in DES we covered a very broad range of science uh, enabled by one imaging survey. And uh, also that uh, the data is, uh, can be quite complicated, often more complicated than an anticipated at the start of the analysis. Um, not naming names, but galaxy clusters are complicated, especially with an optical selection. Uh, in um, interpreting um, these different measurements, accurate selection functions are crucial, uh, but really straightforward. And um, we have already seen that uh, machine learning excels at certain classification tasks. However, the training data require some re realistic se selection function to begin with. So that puts us in a difficult spot, which will become more complicated uh, as we move to um, um, more constraining data sets, um, where these selection biases become significant at an even more subtle level. Um, basically, you can summarize this as selection bias uh, in, calibration bias out. And uh, um, in order to avoid that, we have to be uh, really creative in how to um, pose these classification other problems to apply them um, to our data sets such that we can uh, separate the classification uh, from the selection function characterization. Thank you. So thanks a lot, Elizabeth. Uh, we already have one question here from uh, Henri, and then another one there. Uh, please, yeah, please thank you. your name. Uh, yeah, it's Henry, Henry McCracken. I'm from EOP. Thank you for the lovely talk. I'm really worried now about the amount of work we'll have to do for Euclid. Um, just can you talk about, a bit about the uh, systematics? Because you talk about how uh, you find all these correlations, for instance, with exposure time and things like this, and then you decide just to reweight them, remove those correlations. But surely, didn't you try to figure out what, why those systematics were in the data in the first place? Um, Rather than just saying, Let's, there's a correlation here, we'll remove it. That was my question. I mean, there is a lot of uh, correlations with, um, for example, s survey properties like air mass, um, PSF and such, uh, that we know will be there. And uh, that will just um, modulate which of the uh, true galaxies make it uh, past the detection threshold. Yeah, sure, but does, not, does that not mean you haven't done your calibration correctly? No. Um, how? How would you uh, correct for all of those uh, without... Uh, right, but if you've got an air mass, you correct your photometry, right? You include the air mass in the photometric calibration. And if you've got a correlation of the exposure time, that means that um, you haven't corrected the exposure time correctly in the photometry. <laughs> well, we have done that, that, that uh, to uh, quite some great, great, right. great detail, um, details uh, in the um, catalog paper. But then, of course, uh, the actual uh, level of calibration. It's not good enough. There's always um, a residual. Uh, there's, al uh, there's always a residual. Is that yeah, it? Yeah, there's always residuals, and uh, that needs to be calibrated for the particular science application. Okay, okay, I understand. And Thanks. these ca calibrations will be different for different galaxy samples, so there is no way to uh, just um, calibrate them all. We have another question up there. Please state your name. Hi, this is Johannes Buchner. Um, very nice talk. Uh, very interesting. Um, I was just uh, confused by one uh, statement that I hope you can clarify on the DES uh, year one, uh, Y1 uh, slide. You said that um, you marginalize over a wide range of selection functions. So I was wondering, uh, does it selection mean... Selection biases. Yeah. Uh, so does it mean um, you allow the selection uh, function or selection bias to vary during the inference or do you try a bunch of them and then you pool the results or how does it work? So uh, this, um, this now refers to a wide range of selection biases and bias in this case uh, is uh, both a selection bias and a secondary um, halo bias. So uh, 
This now um, basically means that um, clusters may have different clustering properties uh, depending on their, uh, um, um, that are correlated with uh, the magnitude of these projection effects. This is, is basically similar to an assembly bias. Okay. And we then create um, 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 a large suite of uh, N body marks uh, that um, exaggerate uh, these uh, selection biases in both directions, uh, from which we get um, um, a conservative prior. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question from uh, Jenny Wagner, well, Wagner sorry, on Slack, and she's asking, OI is a percentage of galaxies requiring deblending. Hmm? OI is a percentage of galaxies requiring deblending. Uh, um, <laughs> Tough question. <laughs> I don't remember. Okay. Uh, of order 20 percentage or so, okay. I, I believe. Um, yeah, and he has a I don't have an answer. I have a question. Oh, uh, but it is great. definitely in the. But Is the answer is definitely in the paper. Is it on the same line? Okay. So we'll go to Mark and then to Yanya. Okay. Hello, Mark Huertas Kumpain. Thank you very much for a uh, talk, very nice. Um, I had a question, you a very general question. You described some uh, key uh, places where ML played a role in the analysis of, of uh, DES. What do you see as the future for uh, future surveys? Where, uh, is there a room for uh, more ML in the analysis of the next generation? Where do you think ML should you know, be developed? Uh, that was my question. <laughs> Great question. So uh, I think it is absolutely required, for example, in Ruben Observatory um, to uh, make sense of the t uh, or to um, prioritize uh, the time domain uh, information. Um, the um, brokers and classifiers are a prime example. Uh, then uh, likely galaxy evolution studies will always uh, rely on um, machine learning classifications going forward uh, for the re remaining. Uh, and uh, I think uh, some PCs uh, are also a, a great tool which I hope will stay around, uh, where the unsupervised uh, aspect really means that we have to worry less about um, how our spectroscopic selection uh, might be biased. The SOM tells us where to follow up, um, rather than us having to reweigh for um, spectroscopic incompletenesses. Uh, so I think uh, that is uh, definitely very forward-looking. For the other problems, uh, I hope we'll figure it out, but uh, I don't think I can name uh, the two or three right now where I think this will definitely be possible. Uh, I think selection, uh, characterizing the selection function will be a major challenge. And more so um, uh, as uh, we become more um, sensitive to systematics. Uh, thanks, Hiranya Pires. Um, very beautiful talk. I really appreciate your attention on, on the selection function. So, so on that issue, um, when you showed the redshift calibration, um, you had the Balrog part in there in your equation. Yeah. Um, so it, that is taking some aspect of the, the, the selection function, right, into yeah. the reweighting. Um, how significant is that currently at the very highest stretch of bins? Is it quite a large correction? I don't remember those numbers, I'm afraid. It is uh, definitely uh, quantified uh, in those papers on the top there but uh, I don't remember the number. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, while people are thinking of other possible questions, I had a question because we are, uh, the title of the conference is debating the potential. So uh, Mark asked you uh, what was the uh, avenue where we, we, you will need machine learning in the mm -hmm. future. Quite a lot of them have been tested already and we saw that on your slides. Which one was the most anticlimactic? I mean, this is also interesting because we need to know not only where we need to work and things that have been tested and where, well, machine learning or at least the method we're using now is not that useful and classical methods are good enough. So not naming names, but is there uh, something that has been tested uh, where, well, that was not fantastic. Yeah, what doesn't work, yeah. Uh, and actually for reflecting Slack, there was the opposite question. So what was the most <laughs> <laughs> required? Okay, so that's a double question then. I 
don't think uh, I have an answer for the failures right now. Okay. Um, that will require some slack archaeology. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so there were some. Hmm? So there were some things that were not fantastic. There might be, but there have been so many things in this analysis <laughs> okay. that uh, uh, I uh, also had to, um, at some point, stop tracking yeah. things that didn't lead okay. anywhere. Uh, I think uh, the SOM PCs uh, are uh, probably um, one of the greatest success stories uh, for machine learning in this analysis um, and also in uh, our contemporary service um, C uh, kids and uh, I believe Angus Wright's talk. Okay, and I have a, a last one which is related to blinding. So this is something we're doing more and more. Uh, it's very difficult to, uh, to blind data. Uh, how does that jive with machine learning? Is there any uh, way we can improve the blinding using machine learning in your view? What would you need to, uh, to improve blinding or, or, or make it uh, more usable or, or less naive than just shifting away parameters in plot or things like that? So. I think, uh, first of all, we have to be careful of blind, about blinding in the sense that we want to be blind but not dumb. Yep. <laughs> so <laughs> our blinding <laughs> should, be, <laughs> should, should be as targeted as possible, mm -hmm. uh, which means then also that it is very uh, application specific. Mm -hmm. And it might be better if we try to talk this through for one particular uh, example. Um, we have um, um, not found uh, a general scheme that applies to all the DES probes consistently. Yep. So. Um, I'm afraid there is no one-fits-all answer, but uh, we could try over coffee. Yeah, yeah no, but that, that's something that could be interesting to discuss because, I mean, uh, Ben yesterday presented, I mean, you presented what we're doing today, which is uh, already uh, uh, used a lot of machine learning in base. Uh, ben yesterday presented his view, which is uh, more of uh, simulating everything and using machine learning a lot to do that. So, uh, so it is really interesting to see the both views and, and where we are and where we perhaps are going. Okay, any other question on uh, in the room? No, uh, I think we've been through all of the questions in uh, in Slack as well. So I propose that we stop here and we'll uh, reconvene in a, a bit more than twenty minutes at eleven twenty uh, for the uh, contributed talks. Thanks a lot and thanks again, uh, Elizabeth.